It's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Frank Edward. Uh, Frank is an assistant professor in the School of Criminal Justice at Rutgers University. He received his PhD in Sociology from the University of Washington in 2017. Frank is broadly interested in issues of social organization and social control and the intersection with the welfare state and racial and ethnic relations. Uh, he has been focusing on two main projects. The first one draws attention to child protection systems as key sites of family disruption. In several publications, he documents how the American child protection system connects with punitive and welfare policy systems, including the history of race relations and, coloni and colonization, and in affecting the spatial and social distribution of family separation. The second project provides a detailed analysis of the prevalence and policy involved killings in the, United, in the US. This project uses novel data and Bayesian methods to provide estimates of mortality risk by race, sex, and place. It also evaluates how institutions and politics affect the prevalence of police violence. Uh, his research has been published in the most prestigious journals in the field, including the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, American Sociological Review, American Journal of Public Health, etc. He has also received considerable media attention with articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the, the Los Angeles Times, etc. So please help me welcome Professor Edwards. Thank you very much, Amelia. And I want to thank Don for all the support in organizing the talk. Uh, and uh, sorry, Courtney couldn't join us today. I was, uh, she, she, she and I uh, met a few months ago, and, and that led to the invitation. So I want to thank her as well. Um, I'm presenting today some work in progress that I'm developing with Teresa Rocha Beardall, my collaborator at the University of Washington. And this is one piece of a larger project that looks at how tribal sovereignty impacts the exposure of American Indian and Alaska Native children to family separation through the foster care system. And we use a framework of settler colonialism to think about that process. But our goal is to provide quantitative models that can help us understand spatial variation and exposure to these kinds of forms of disruption and violence uh, using rich theoretical frameworks developed from qualitative and historical research. Um, so I'm going to make a very broad set of arguments today. First, I'm going to build on Patrick Wolfe's theory of settler colonization to argue that material interests in land and labor drive the ways that settler states engage in particular racial projects. Now, Wolfe argues that there are two fundamental interests a settler state has in building out infrastructure and building out its polity. Those are the dispossession of indigenous land and the exploitation of various forms of labor. Those two interests lead to differential processes of racialization that result in a set of policy outcomes that we'll talk about. But in the context of the United States, we're going to be looking at three groups in particular, white immigrants, we're going to be looking at American Indians and Alaska Natives, and black people. Uh, but within this, we're kind of using this materialist framework that Wolf developed to kind of lead our initial uh, process assumptions. We're also going to make the relatively, I think, banal argument that institutions develop in historically and spatially variable socio-political contexts. Now, I think we should all take this for granted, but I don't think the literature often does uh, in terms of its practical application when we think about examining policy systems in different places at different times. So I'm going to argue that the trajectories matter for understanding how places result and that these developmental trajectories result in outcomes that we can see today. They leave traces, in Wolf's words, he calls these traces of history, but they leave traces that we can see in the distribution of outcomes today. Um, so, social policy regimes are products of historical institutions. That's the fundamental argument that I'll be advancing today. And I'm gonna do this through three time periods. The first we're gonna start with is in the progressive era. Uh, so this was an explosive era of growth in welfare state infrastructure across the United States. And as folks like Cybel Fox and many others have demonstrated, this played out in regionally uneven ways as a function of the political economy of race at the place level. So I'm going to argue that three core policy projects had particular salience in the progressive era, but this is not an exhaustive list. The first is the expropriation and elimination of native nations. 1890 marks the 
end of the period of Indian Wars. The massacre at Wounded Knee takes place in 1890. Uh, and the United States moves into a rapid program of forced assimilation and dispossession from the 1890s to 1910s, which is called in uh, the history, uh, kind of legal history of, of federal Indian law as the assimilation period. But this is a, a period in time in which the boarding schools are deployed in large numbers. The forced separation of Indian children from their families uh, drives massive demographic shifts in indigenous populations. And the goal of these programs is explicitly in the words of Colonel Pratt from the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania to quote, kill the Indian and save the man, right? The explicit goal was the eradication of indigeneity as such, right, through cultural assimilation. The second project that we'll be uh, thinking about is the ongoing exploitation of black labor and repression of black political power. Uh, and of course here we can think about uh, the known carve outs for uh, New Deal era welfare policies for agricultural and domestic workers, but this extends very broadly. Uh, the infrastructure for social welfare in the South uh, was relatively non-existent during this period to the extent it did exist. It was entirely privately funded and systematically excluded black people. The goal, of course, was to ensure that black people remain dependent on the exploitative wage labor market or sharecropping system or other kinds of uh, systems in place. And the third project I'd like to think about today is the incorporation of white immigrants into the settler polity, right? That is the a uh, broad array of efforts in the Northeast and Midwest, particularly in cities, to fold uh, mostly Southern and Eastern European immigrants into the national fold, right? To incorporate them rapidly into the American body politic. And I'm going to argue that these three projects had variable salience regionally, right? As a function of the political interests of the settler state and the settler elites in particular times and places. Uh, so these resulting politics lead to spatial variation in the kind of infrastructure for the welfare state that gets built out during the progressive era. Of course, Seidel Fox's work has showed this very well. Linda Gordon has discussed this process as well. Ira Katz Nelson works, uh, demonstrates this really well, as does Jill Quidognos. There's a lot of historical uh, research that shows that we have this uneven development of the welfare state, and I'm trying to build insights from that while combining it with the legacy of the boarding schools to think about how that might inform infrastructures moving forward. Okay, we're gonna com that's our time one. So this is kind of our foundation, right? Our time two, uh, we're gonna look at the Great Migration and the Termination Era. Uh, so as demographers, of course, we're all gonna be quite familiar with the Great Migration and its implications. Uh, but what I'm mostly interested in here is what happened to black people as they arrived in places that had robust welfare states developed during time one. And there's a lot of great historical research that shows what happened. Uh, Michaela Simmons has a great paper in ASR from a couple of years ago that shows in New York City institutions that were explicitly built out for Catholic and Protestant immigrants uh, were forced to, the Protestant institutions were forced to incorporate black migrants into those services as they did. But as they did so, they used the frameworks of delinquency to fold them in. And so we end up with a punitive transition of organizations that were initially paternalistic, no doubt, but they turn in a more explicitly punitive direction as black immigrants are folded into the process. This is something Kianga Taylor has also described well in describing the predatory inclusion of African Americans into housing programs. So we see this, uh, and, and, and of course, Billingsley and Giovanni did some foundational work in Cleveland that showed the experience of black children coming into the system it was fundamentally different in the 1970s than the experience of white children had had several decades earlier. Right? So we see this already existing institution encounter a new target population and pivot in a punitive direction. Right? Um, so that's one piece of the puzzle that we want to model at time two. The other piece we want to model is a kind of continuity that emerges in the termination era. So following a brief interregnum uh, that's called the self-determination era in the 1930s, during which the Indian New Deal was passed and tribal sovereignty was lifted up, uh, we return in the 1950s to a program of the aggressive dispossession of native land, the aggressive termination of native nations. Hundreds of native nations lose their federal recognition, and in so doing, any obligations the federal government had made through treaties. Um, and forced assimilation is rampant through both 
uh, urban relocation programs to move indigenous people from traditional lands to cities, but also through the mass adoption and fostering of native children. It's estimated uh, by the Association of American Indian Affairs prior to the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978 that about one in three native children nationally had been placed in a non-native foster or adoptive home. Um, and unfortunately, in some states, those numbers are still exceptionally high. And it's precisely in those states where they were high in 1978 where they remain high today. Uh, but this process of, 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 so we have kind of these dual policy processes or dem demographic processes that are informing institutional change at time two. And then we're going to think about how those two sets of events uh, help us understand outcomes today. That is, I'm going to borrow Dorothy Roberts' language to call the Contemporary Child Protective System a system of family policing, uh, in which CPS engages in the widespread surveillance and separation and dissolution of mostly black and indigenous families. And the argument I'm going to advance is that we can understand the contemporary geography of family policing in terms of its scope and its racial character as a function of these historical institutional processes that we can take a look at the contemporary distribution of foster care placements by racial group and see how they follow from these institutional processes. Um, at least that's the argument I'll try to make. Uh, so racial and settler colonial projects in US social policy development in the progressive year. Here I'm just going to give a kind of quick overview in a little more detail of uh, these policy processes, um, which I think I've summarized pretty well already. But again, the, the goals of uh, federal policy in the progressive era were explicitly the destruction of native nations and the cession of native lands. And the goals of the management of black labor in the South were the exploitation of labor and the suppression of black political power. The goals of the assimilation of white immigrants in the industrial Northeast and Midwest were the incorporation of immigrants into the white polity, but also the management of social problems caused by rapid urbanization and industrialization. The articulation of normative standards of middle class white mothering uh, through the nascent field of social work, right? And through the institutionalization of the social sciences also I think plays a really big role in building up the foundations upon which later social policy systems are going to be built. So I want to take a second to just kind of give us a sense of the geography of this, right? So the argument is that we have these three uh, racial projects, and they have variable geographic savings, right? So this is the distribution of the African-American population as uh, expressed as a percentage in 1900. This is the distribution of the foreign-born white population in 1900. And this is the distribution of the American Indian and Alaska Native population in 1900. I call that an undercount because it almost certainly is. And note that this is on a logarithmic scale for color rather than a linear scale for color um, because I want to uh, emphasize Alaska, for example, uh, at this time is represented as having about 50% of the population be Native. But these numbers in the 1900 census are a wild undercount. But they would capture the salience of the group for political decision making in as much as they represent state knowledge about the distribution. But when we see some really clear patterns here that are not going to be surprising. Uh, the Deep South, uh, the South has uh, nearly all of the nation's black population. The Northeast and Midwest have very large shares of white immigrant populations, as does the West. Uh, and American Indians and Alaska Natives have largely been pushed out of the eastern region of the United States into the West by this point. Now, I want to map these onto the policy outcomes, though, of course. right? We're going to use these population predictors in our models to proxy for the policy process. And measuring social policy in the 1900s is not a particularly easy thing to do. So I'm going to use two sources to help us think through this process. And I'm really relying on the historical research to set a strong prior that we know that the Northeast and Midwest built out really uh, elaborate systems for both private and public social welfare and that the U.S. South simply did not do that. But we can see some evidence of that as well in the quantitative data. So this is data from the uh, 1915, or from 1920, uh, it's a financial uh, report on U.S. state spending. And the category I'm using here aggregates spending from uh, various public health and charity uh, operations in addition to uh, direct relief spending, which is relatively small in all states. So on the left panel here, we have the percent population white immigrant. On the right panel here, we have the population uh, percent population black. And on the y-axis, we have social policy spending per capita. And we see incredibly clear linear relationships. Those states with higher white immigrant populations spent far more on various kinds of social policy systems than did states with large black populations. 
whereas black populations spent very, very little on social policy infrastructure in this period. Another way we could measure this is this is the data that Sybil Fox uses in her Three Worlds study is to look at relief expenditures prior to the Great Depression. So this is uh, 1929, and we can see that place, so this is uh, the amount spent by both private and public agencies on outdoor relief, that is just cash transfers. Um, and we can see, again, an incredibly clear linear relationship. States with higher uh, white immigrant populations spend dramatically more on relief per capita than did states with large black populations, which spent virtually nothing on uh, outdoor relief prior to the Depression. So we have a really clear regional pattern here. High immigrant states, more spending, more infrastructure for social welfare. Large black population states, low spending, low infrastructure. And this is the distribution of the American Indian Alaska Native uh, boarding schools. That is, these, for those who aren't aware, these were institutions that forcibly separated Native children from their families and aggressively worked to erase indigenous cultures and instill in Native children uh, distinctly Christian and distri distinctly uh, kind of uh, industrial uh, sort of approaches. These, these, these schools often directly instructed boys in various trades instructed girls in domestic work, prohibited the speaking of native languages, uh, engaged in widespread physical punishment. Mass graves have been discovered at many of these sites as well. And the uh, Department of the Interior under Secretary Deb Holland has recently commissioned a, a group to study the distribution of these sites and also to start to uncover the histories of these sites. Until this year, we didn't have an official list of the sites of federal Indian boarding schools. And these were institutions often directly operated by the federal government. And in those cases where they weren't, they received funding. Religious organizations often operated these with funding from the American government. So this shows us the distribution of the boarding schools. Those states in dark blue had more than 20. Those states in light blue had very few. Uh, in places like Pennsylvania, we actually have a relatively, um, if we go back to our population distribution map, we can actually kind of see the effect of the boarding school on the population distribution. Indigenous tribes had been largely pushed out of Pennsylvania by this point, but the Carlisle Indian School had a population of about 1,000 children in there who were counted as being residents of the state. So we can actually kind of see the demography of displacement through the boarding schools kind of baked in here. Okay, so that's our starting conditions, right? We have low welfare spending, low welfare infrastructure in the South, high welfare spending, high welfare infrastructure in the Midwest and Northeast, and boarding school infrastructure in the Midwest and West, right? That's kind of the crude um, framework that we're working at. Now, upon these foundations, we have a process of institutional layering that occurs. That is, right, institutions are not reinvented whole cloth. Policy institutions are not reinvented whole cloth periodically, right? We build policy institutions on top of what's already there. And that's precisely what happened during the Great Migration. So again, this is not going to be a surprising map to demographers, but we can see uh, the change in proportion of black population for each U.S. state between 1900, and I'm stopping in 1974 for the very particular reason that that's the first time we get federal legislation mandating that states engage in the surveillance of child abuse and neglect. So we get this law called uh, CAFTA passed in uh, 1974 that demands that states implement some system to engage in the surveillance and reporting of child abuse and neglect. So I want to kind of take that as our sort of end point to think about what had changed in these states over that period of time. And obviously we can see very large increases in black population shares along the Northeast, particularly the urban Northeast and Midwest, and huge population declines in the South. Also, of course, we have a lot of migration out to the West too, and the West will kind of come into the story pretty clearly. Um, now what happened during the migration, right? Black migrants to northern, midwestern, and western states encountered these already existing institutions, and those institutions pivoted, right? So they have a built infrastructure, but they're not starting from nowhere. Uh, stark and violent segregation was routine, and we saw this coercive and punitive repurposing of otherwise paternalistic welfare programs. These were never strictly redistributed welfare programs, right? These always operated on principles of least eligibility and kind of Elizabethan poor law philosophies to be supplanted by kind of progressive era philosophies, but those were never strictly redistributed with some very narrow exceptions. Um, we also have high levels of police violence, 
and increasingly frequent and unequal incarceration and, uh, in, uh, that black people are encountering as they move north. Um, the termination era, uh, again, results in widespread attempts to eliminate tribes through assimilation, relocation, mass adoption. So the example for the termination era I'm going to point to, so we, we're going to think about the change in black population as our, as our predictor for understanding the impact of the migration on state level policy systems. For thinking about the impact of the termination era, we're going to turn to Public Law 280. Um, so Public Law 280 uh, was a law that uh, stripped the jurisdiction for criminal prosecution on tribal lands from the federal government and passed it to state and local policy actors. Now this sounds like a really technical thing and a lot of jurisdictional questions in Indian country are really narrow and technical. But in this case, this was done without tribal consent and it resulted in incredibly hostile interactions between local governments and tribal, uh, tribal governments. So for example, in Wisconsin, uh, the uh, FBI would have previously been responsible for prosecuting homicides, investigating and prosecuting homicides that occurred in Indian country. Now that falls to the local sheriff, right? And that local sheriff has often antagonistic relationships with the local tribes or little interest in providing effective law enforcement in Indian country. Uh, there have been a number of attempts to remedy this through the Violence Against Women Act. The, many people speculate that these kinds of jurisdictional problems um, have a causal effect on the widespread problem of missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, but we can see here that there's a select group of states in the Midwest and on the West Coast where we have a very clear affront to tribal sovereignty. Tribes did not consent to this transfer of jurisdiction, and most tribes strongly opposed it. Yes? And what year was? So PL-280, uh, 1953, I believe, but then uh, there were clauses in it that allowed other states to opt into it over time, and there's a few states where it applies to certain tribes and not others. So it's, it's a bit of a tangled mess and has evolved to be a tangled mess over time. But those dark colored states are the states where those are what we're calling the mandatory PL-280 states where all jurisdiction in on tribal lands was handed from the federal government to state and local authorities without tribal consent. The yellow states are what are called the optional states that later opted into public that transfer of jurisdiction in whole or in part. In most of the yellow states, it wasn't the entire state where jurisdiction was transferred. It was only certain tribal lands where jurisdiction was transferred. And it, again, it seems like a kind of fuzzy thing to relate criminal jurisdiction to child welfare system evolution. But again, this is a really strong proxy for how these state governments related to tribal sovereigns and the processes of, um, of uh, diplomacy and, and consent and, and consensus building that were present at the so we're using this as a kind of geographic proxy for aggressive attempts to eliminate native sovereignty in various ways. Now today, uh, our time three, we're going to kind of treat using panel data from 1900, I'm sorry, from 2000 to 2020 uh, that looks at the child welfare system. And the basic institutional form of child welfare in the United States is the mass surveillance and investigation of families. So about one in two black children over the life course experience an investigation, uh, about one in five Native children nationally experience an investigation, but that's really regionally uneven. In Alaska, it's about 80% of Native children ever get investigated by CPS. And in some states, it's as many as two-thirds of black children get investigated by CPS. So this is a modal life event in a lot of places for indigenous kids and for black kids. And that's why I think it's appropriate to call it mass surveillance and investigation. And this is not receiving a call, this is receiving a knock on the door from CPS. And it's an incredibly invasive experience to experience it. Um, I don't know if, uh, Kelly Fong's work is one of the few that really drives out what that experience of investigation feels like. So I strongly recommend her recent AJS, if you haven't read it, um, to better understand the investigation process. Uh, we have frequent separation through foster care. Uh, again, the prevalence rates for indigenous children and black children nationally are more than one in 10 uh, children can ever expect to enter foster care. If we look per capita, the rates for foster care placement at any point in time are very similar to incarceration rates. So we see similar per capita rates of foster care placement for black children that we see for the incarceration of black adults. We have the routine dissolution of uh, family ties through the termination of parental rights, and we have deep and geographically variable racial inequalities. So this is the distribution of the outcomes we'll be looking at. Um, top left is American Indian and Alaska Native children in foster care as a percent of the population. And this is not lifetime risk. This is just single year 2019 in Minnesota, 15% of Native kids were in foster care in 2019. And that's staggering. 
right? Lifetime risk there is over one in three. Um, it's an incredibly uh, high rate. Um, and we see that the rates of foster care contact for indigenous kids are high throughout the Great Plains states uh, and the Northwest and in Alaska as well. Uh, black foster care rates also tend to be high in the Midwest and Northeast and low in the South. White foster care rates uh, are relatively distributed nationally. West Virginia lights up um, as white poverty is, is pretty deep there. And West Virginia has a particularly aggressive and um, surveillance infrastructure for their welfare systems. Um, the bottom panel is investigations. So these are uh, a call to CPS that the agency sends out someone to investigate the claim. And again, these are percentages of the population investigated. In Alaska, we have about one in three investigated in 2019. Again, the lifetime rates of those investigations are closer to 80%. But those same clusters of states that have high foster care placements tend to have high levels of investigations, which isn't particularly surprising given that that's the front door into the system. These are disproportionalities. So I just want to think about these as rate ratios to think about levels of inequality. Uh, here, we can see in Minnesota, about 20 to 1 inequality for native kids relative to white kid risk for foster care placement. That is 20 times more native kids per capita are being placed in foster care in Minnesota than they are in uh, white children. And again, notice that I've got this on a logarithmic scale here just so we can capture the full range um, uh, because these rate ratios get skewed pretty quickly. But the same basic regional patterns hold. Now, I want us to kind of pay attention to this map for a moment. Uh, the Northeast and Midwest and have much higher levels of inequality in black-white foster care contact than does the U.S. South. But they also have lower per capita levels of black foster care contact than does the Midwest and Northeast. So we have both a difference in exposure and inequality, right? It's not simply a question of inequality. It's a question of exposure as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what do you use? These are 2019. Uh, from AFGARs? AFGARs and NCANs. Yeah, so uh, the, I'm sorry. Yeah, these are federal data. This is a census of all children in the child welfare system with either a screen and investigation on the bottom, sorry, I'm going a little fast through these, uh, or a foster care placement at any point during the year. So these are not entries. These are just children ever in foster care in that year. AFGARS uh, collects uh, six-month data for every child who's in state custody in foster care. Uh, the data goes back to the mid-1990s. NCANs collects data on every screened-in investigation, that is where an, a, 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 a caseworker is dispatched to do an investigation after a call to a hotline. Uh, so we have about uh, 600,000 children annually in the AFGARS data and about 4 million reports annually in the NCANS data. Yeah? I'm so sorry. Does the AIN here, does that distinguish between race or the political jurisdiction? Excellent question. We don't actually know political jurisdiction in these data, which is a huge problem for anyone who knows the Indian Child Welfare Act, right? Uh, and anything about tribal sovereignty. We don't know tribal affiliation. We don't know tribal citizenship in these data. Um, the Biden administration, the Obama administration actually uh, created an order to mandate the collection of those data, which was shelved for uh, quite a long time, that's now being reconsidered. And I'm optimistic that we will get tribal affiliation data soon. So this is a racial identification, and it's collected by the caseworker. Uh, so it could be uh, the caseworker themselves making a racial identification. It could be the child racially identifying. It could be the parent racially identifying. And if we want to get into the nitty gritty, and we're demographers, right? So we, do, we can imagine that like the salience of indigeneity as a racial identity is regionally variable. So the probability of being identified as native conditional on location probably does vary. Right? So I would expect someone who is native to be more likely to be positively identified in a place with more native people than, a, than if they were in Mississippi or Alabama. So there's some potential bias in there. Uh, let's talk more about sovereignty later. Um, OK, so um, let's propose a really quick historical institutionalist model. Sorry, um, is that clock accurate? No. 12.30. OK, cool. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I know. Uh, okay, context at time one, institution at time one, context at time two, institution at time two. This is unobjectionable, right? We argue that there's some causal relationship between an institution at time one and an institution at time two, and the contexts are going to mediate that relationship or affect it in some way. 
These are not exhaustive causal models. I don't intend these to be DAGs. But um, the basic idea, right, is that racial politics is time one, informs our starting conditions, whether we had boarding schools and underdeveloped welfare state or private charity organizations at time one. The Great Migration and the Termination Era also affect system outcomes at time two, and then somehow those affect system outcomes at time three. There's a lot that's outside of this system, but I want to draw a kind of general macrosociological account that can help us understand and contextualize spatial differences. So I'll kind of go quickly through prior research. We know that historical institutions deeply structure contemporary social outcomes through some work conducted here and at many other places. The outcomes we'll measure here are children reported by mandated reporters, children in foster care. We're going to use racial population composition at time one, Indian boarding schools as a count at time two, and we'll use the square root of that. Uh, the year of statehood to capture the salience of uh, land dispossession, right? States that entered the Union later were frontier states in which the Indian Wars ended later, and efforts at relocation and dispossession ended later. The delta racial composition at time two and system involved child race ethnicity at time three. And then I'll run one additional set of models that includes contemporary controls. Um, so the models will run are negative binomial. Um, the focal model I'm going to show you uh, treats the outcomes, uh, that is expected counts of children in foster care and investigations as a function of these time one and time two dynamics. And we allow the parameters for those to vary by the race of the focal child outcome. And then we add a state-specific random effect. Um, in model two, I'm going to add those contemporary controls just to see if those contemporary controls um, partial out the historical patterns we observe. These are estimated through Hamiltonian Monte Carlo using STAN. Um, I can talk more about the models later if you want. OK. I'm going to talk about four potential trajectories that we can think about structuring contemporary outcomes. One is a weak welfare state, which we've already kind of covered these in some detail, but we'll say it's similar to the process in the US South. Large black population at time one, small white immigrant population at time one, few Indian boarding schools at time one, large decline in black population share at time two, and uh, PL280 not in effect at time two. We Scenario two, we'll say, is similar to the US North. Uh, that is a robust welfare state at time one and a punitive repurposing of that welfare state with a new population arrive, a black population arriving in time two. That is small black population initially, large white immigrant population, few Indian boarding schools, and a large increase in black population share. And then we're going to look at the U.S. West, which had the combination of both small initial black populations, large initial white immigrant populations, and the boarding schools and public law to me. Uh, and we'll look at one where public law 280 is optional as well, just to round it out. So we kind of have, we're thinking about how these trajectories might structure contemporary outcomes. So here are the findings. One are similar to US South model, that is the model where we have a large initial black population, large out migration, few boarding schools. We expect to see relatively few contemporary children placed in foster care. Now, 10 per thousand is still too many children in foster care. So I don't want to call that low, but relative to the rest of the nation, it's low. Uh, we have lower levels of expected foster care placement for white and native children in the US South. In the US North, we see quite large expected levels of children in foster care. That is when we, uh, the only inputs into the model here are our time one population, time two population change, child race ethnicity for these counts, right? And so we get large expected differences in um, black foster care placement for children in the US North and in the Midwest. So this includes a scenario where we have boarding schools present as well, uh, and we have public law 280 in effect during the termination year. We also see much higher expected levels of indigenous foster care in those Midwestern states. And in the US West, we see similarly high levels for indigenous and black children expected under these scenarios. So this is only with those time one and time two predictors. When we add time three predictors in, the triangle shows the point estimate for those models. So the basic patterns hold. Uh, the Midwest is under predicting uh, with just the historical models, the contemporary levels of black placement and native placement. Uh, when we add those contemporary predictors in, the model fits a bit better there. But we get the basic pattern down with just the historical population information. Just one. Yeah. Any reason why you don't have Hispanics here? Um, because 
they are typically not singled out for foster care um, in the same way that black and indigenous children are. Um, there are places where, where foster care placement rate for uh, uh, Latinx children is really high, um, but it's uncommon. And I think that's kind of a, 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 a puzzle in the field. But the reason I focus on black and indigenous children here is for the kind of historical reasons that foster care in particular has really singled out those communities for intervention um, in a way that links cleanly to historical institutions, in a way that is less applicable for uh, Hispanic children. Linda Gordon has a great book on um, one case where that wasn't true in Arizona, where we had uh, a group of Mexican migrants who encountered nuns at an Indian boarding school who forcibly took away the children and brought them into the boarding school environment. Uh, so there are certainly cases where uh, children who are uh, non-white, who are not indigenous or black, were impacted by the child welfare system, but the regional patterns don't look the same in the institutional history. It's quite different. But the data registers have basically... Yes, it does. It does. The contemporary data does. Uh, okay. Tracing you know, Hispanic ethnicity backwards through the census is a whole other question. Yeah, so that maybe yeah, no, there, no, we do get ethnicity here. Um, so in other work, I've looked at, at Latino children, but for here, I wanted to um, focus exclusively on indigenous and black. This is for investigations. And the basic patterns, well, you can see our estimates are quite a bit noisier here. But we see the same general pattern. Except in the South, we do see high levels of black reporting, right? but low levels of black foster care. Uh, so system, the front door of the system uh, seems to be quite wide for black children in the South, but then the system is processing less frequently into foster care. But the basic regional pattern of high black rates uh, of exposure in the North, Midwest, and West holds, and high exposure for Native children in the Midwest and West holds as well. Uh, that's with the contemporary controls. I think the foster care outcomes are, are more interesting, but investigations gives us another way to think about the process, too. OK, so to briefly conclude, I know we're I, I always switch time, and I apologize for that. Um, family policing is a function of historical institutions, right? Black children are more likely to be in foster care in states that had developed infrastructure for social services in the progressive era and saw an influx of black migrants during the migration. Native children are more likely to be in foster care in states that both had that infrastructure developed in the progressive era and had boarding schools. Levels of black child investigation are high cross-regionally. Native investigation is more frequent in places that had boarding schools. So briefly, I think this work has quite a few theoretical implications. But the first I'd like to point to is that multiple racial projects can simultaneously structure contemporary policy outcomes. Right? We tend to narrowly focus on uh, processes of racialization in single policy domains or with single groups. And I think we can interact these things. We can acknowledge that the US has multiple active racial projects at any point in history, and that the infrastructure we build to solve those particular problems interact with each other in unexpected ways, and in ways that are institutionally driven. Um, we need to think about contemporary institutions, that is something like the child protection system, as being layered on top of historical institutions. We didn't invent it whole cloth when we passed federal legislation in the 1970s, and then again in the 1980s and 90s. And the thing I would like to emphasize on this is I don't think these insights are new. This is something that historians and qualitative scholars and critical scholars and legal scholars have understood for a very long time. But I think it's something that quantitative uh, approaches to understanding social policy outcomes and understanding demography, I think we can incorporate these insights relatively in a relatively straightforward way. And I think it's, it's, it's time that we do that. Um, so that's, that's it. Thank you. Questions, comments? Um, so thank you for your talk. This was fantastic. Um, I'd be curious to hear if you looked at, because looking at some of your slides on um, the uh, AIA and involvement in just investigations and in foster care, it seems, I don't know if you've read the GAO report on Native youth involvement in justice system, mm -hmm. but the distribution looks very similar, so I'd be curious to see those. We have another paper on that. Do you uh, really? Yeah. Um, so in another paper, we look at police-involved killings of Native people and incarceration of Native people, not specifically from the GAO data, but we see really tight overlap between um, 
various, we, we're, we're, we think of that as kind of various modalities of state violence um, overlapping. But yeah, yeah. Uh, if you map out where native people are killed by police, it's precisely in these places, and it's also along border communities, uh, reservation border communities. But that, yeah. So was this specifically with youth incarceration? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll take a look at that. Was that based on the? Um, it was okay. just a review of all of the federal data they could get, and also state Okay, yeah, and there's a there's a series on youth incarcerated and, and adults incarcerated within Indian country facilities, uh, but then capturing them in state and local facilities gets a lot more complicated because the race ethnicity data is not perfect at all. No, I'll, I'll definitely take a look at that. But yes, the incarceration outcomes, the policing outcomes, very cleanly map onto what we're seeing. As part of your introduction, you referred to Henry Wolf with the uh, emphasis on land and labor. I don't want to say markets, whatever, but let me say markets. Uh, how does that tie in with your analysis here? Yeah. Um, so it kind of gives us a the initial um, theoretical foundation to think about why we would see infrastructure, different kinds of infrastructures emerge in different kinds of places. So I guess the best way to explain it is to take this population map, right? And the project of extracting black labor and repressing black power is most salient in, the, in those places where enslaved people were brought to work to plantations and where they were, uh, where they remained during the post reconstruction period, right? Um, and so we, we, we end up with a set of policy institutions that reflect that racial project, right? That reflect the project of preserving the ties of, in, 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 in a coercive paternalistic way, preserving black ties to white landholders and other kinds of white employers. Um, and so that political economy, that kind of racialized political economy, drives us toward a weak welfare state. Right? We don't build a welfare state in places where we want to preserve a racialized labor dependence. Right? Um, by contrast, in places where uh, indigenous people have not yet been removed from the land, and obviously have not been fully removed from the land of the United States, right? we're still on uh, occupied territory, uh, the goal of indigenous dispossession and cultural eradication is just not salient if you're in Philadelphia in 1900. Right? Um, it's not an active mission. So you're not going to build infrastructure to do that project. So I guess I'm, I'm taking Wolf's like, basic insight that on the one hand, the settler state seeks to eliminate native nations by dispossessing their land. And on the other hand, they find ways to exploit labor to make that land profitable, right? Uh, to help us understand the geographic specificity of different kinds of policy systems that emerge. So I guess I'm trying to do like a meso level adaptation of his macro level theory. Wendy and then Rebecca. Thank you, this is a fascinating talk. Um, obviously, um, targeting the AIN community for uh, foster care and removal from families is terrible in and of itself. But because you framed it partly in terms of cultural eradication and forced assimilation, can you tell us anything about the geographic pattern to, of which you know the, the children would be taken away from their families but placed within the community? as opposed to, you know, no consideration given whatsoever, which meant they probably ended up outside. Yeah. Um, we know way less about this than I would like. Um, so the records, so are you talking about the contemporary placements or the historical placements? I'm more interested in historical, yeah. but you know about contemporary too. So I, I, a little bit of both. Um, the historical data are really sparse, as you can imagine. Um, what we know about the uh, mass adoption programs in the 1950s and 1960s uh, that persisted through the 70s um, is largely because a group of attorneys working for the Association on American Indian Affairs went out and collected data through surveys and, and um, basically compiled a list of every agency they thought might be involved in Indian adoption in 15 states and just wrote to them requesting information on how many kids they had. Um, we know that virtually all of them were placed with non-Indian families. Um, how many cross state lines? We don't know, uh, to my knowledge. Um, today, so ICWA, for those of you who don't know the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is under threat right now, and there's a Supreme Court case in November that threatens to overturn it. Um, so that's 
absolutely something we should be paying attention to and something I think um, people interested in uh, questions of, of justice in this space, the initial welfare act has to remain. But um, it mandates that native children, children who uh, are entitled to the protections of ICWA are children who are eligible for enrollment in a tribe. And one of the first uh, conditions of ICWA is that when a placement, when a foster care removal happens, that child should be placed with family first, a member of the tribe second, and a member of another indigenous community third. Uh, but what I found is that that's not happening in about 50% of the cases where children are identified as American Indian Alaska Native. Um, it's uh, really common for Native children to be placed outside of what we would consider those placement preferences to be. The data we have to track it are not perfect. So, and again, they don't capture actual ICWA eligibility. They capture race, right, which we need to keep those as distinct concepts, right? We have citizenship and race as kind of distinct entities. So, the answer is we don't really know, but it happens a lot. Yeah. Yes, I have a general question about institutions. And, uh, and uh, I'd like to know whether initial institutions are instrumented, because you know that as a moment where he explains the rule of the law in terms of whose work was that again? Darren as a rule of the MIT. Okay, okay. He explains the rule of law in terms of European settlers' mortality rate in the 15th century. Mm -hmm. And I think the sample hmm. includes USA. Interesting. I haven't seen that paper. I need to, where was that published? American Economic Review. I need to check that out. Yeah. 2000. Okay. And, uh, and that has been very influential. Okay. In economic analysis of institutions. Okay. Yeah. I, I thank you. I need to check that out. Uh, yeah, everything going to the brief because he's been going on for a long time. Um, but throughout throughout the talk, the one thing that I've been dealing with in my work as well is how to talk about this in terms of racialization, as was mentioned, and, and sovereignty. So the overlap, Wolf or Dunbar or Tees or whoever, or Nick Estes, right? We're talking about sovereignty in a large way, whereas like um, you know others are talking about racialization. I think you're constrained by your data, say AFRs and NCAN that is talking about it in a racial category. And one thing that we're trying to do in our in, in the group I'm working in is actually try to find try to find a latent variable within AFRs to actually pull out uh, to pull out who would more likely be indigenous or not according to the sovereignty. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. How are you constructing that? Uh, we can talk more. Yeah, I'd love uh, to know. I don't know the detail, like the full details. The, the like the main author on the paper is allowing me to, to, to participate. Okay. But yeah, I can imagine a spatial model could do some of that, but then you're making a lot of assumptions and tribal populations are dispersed and citizenship is, yeah. And this is one of the huge problems with ICWA implementation is we had mass relocation of, uh, of, of Indian people to uh, very dispersed cities throughout the 1950s and 60s. So, you know, if uh, a, a tribe wants to claim jurisdiction on a, a child, they may have a case in Florida when they're located in South Dakota, right? Because the populations have just been pushed around so much. So I, I, no, I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. it's really, really exciting to hear. More, but yeah. From what I know, uh, yeah. it's, in, it's in progress. The cool. other part I'm thinking is like, the interesting finding to me in this is you said something along the lines, right, of the investigations are higher in areas where there were boarding schools. Am I, am I right in, in that finding or mm -hmm. in the area? And I think that's interesting in, in the way that we think about how investigations happen currently and the debate that's happening around uh, are people, uh, so this, this idea about poverty, right? So people who are in poverty tend to have, tend to um, have more investigation, or have, tend to have um, more reports of maltreatment or et cetera. Uh, and, and is that because uh, uh, just because they're poor, or is there, is there another something in between which has to do with they're interacting more with organizations or they're in interacting more with uh, institutions, uh, and so those institutions are mandatory reporters in there, and, you know, and they're then reporting these, these children. And I think it's interesting if we look at the boarding school in this in this case, it kind of acts a similar way as as that theory where you have institutions actually seeing and mandating reporting and boarding schools 
sort of acting in a, in, in a linear way, where they're seeing the, the, the indigenous children and they're putting their bias on and they're making the phone call. Or however, mm -hmm. or they're sending a, a telegram, I guess, in that time, or however that was. Yeah, but uh, I don't think anyone was mandated reporting anything when yes. the telegrams, because yeah, we all get, but, but you're right. And, and, and I like what you're, you're emphasizing, right, that we have multiple causal vectors that could be going on here, right? We know, for example, the boarding schools have had profound negative consequences for life chances for indigenous people in a whole host of ways, right? So we could imagine a maltreatment pathway through which exposure to a boarding school causes intergenerational trauma that results in, you know, uh, exposure to adverse childhood experiences that we might identify as maltreatment, right? Which results in an investigation, which results in foster care. But it might also be the case that uh, people living in these communities are touched by institutions that are primed to make child abuse and neglect calls to the hotline all the time, which is something we see a lot in Alaska. Uh, talking to indigenous communities in Alaska, you'll hear them say, we have you know, these white social workers or white teachers come up from the lower 48, they don't know our communities, and then they see something that they don't like and they call it in immediately, right? And so we, I think both vectors are plausible, and I think they both fit the theory in some way, too, that we can point to an institutional antecedent to both of those discrimination processes and those kind of material processes. So I, you know, I, 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 it's a tough challenge in this research to ever tease those things out. Um, you know, what's actual maltreatment versus what's hyper surveillance. Um, and I think in part that's because maltreatment is a legal and social construct in a lot of ways that we need to interrogate more deeply. Of course there's real child abuse and real child sexual abuse and I don't want to minimize that at all. But, um, you know, when we're talking about these cases, more than 70% of these cases are for alleged neglect, which most of the time is simple poverty. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I'm curious because a lot of the framing in this is focused on these like regional patterns and then kind of determining of the simulation. And so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about the focus on like regionality um, and like whether this regional lens is kind of the salient lens for thinking about institutional trajectories and historical trajectories. Yeah. Um, so for my part, I mean, to be honest, it kind of starts for me, um, and we were talking about um, a 2016 paper I published a little while ago. But I started with kind of thinking about Minnesota and Mississippi when looking at these racial inequality maps, right? And thinking about, you know, why do we see incredibly high levels of inequality for both native and black kids in a place like Minnesota and incredibly low levels in a place like Mississippi. But then we look at Mississippi for criminal justice contact and we see really high levels of incarceration for black families. So child welfare is kind of this interesting um, institutional location for this question because it sits at the border of the welfare and the carceral state, right? But, so regionally, I think the only reason region makes sense here is because of the racial demographic history of the United States, right? And the way that policy unfolds as a function of that racial geography. Uh, without that, I don't think, I think region to me just stands in for that. Um, and I guess, you know, we can kind of use it to increase our end in terms of, um, thinking through different sets of conditions that might structure policy in different directions. But I do think that the US region matters quite a lot because we have that kind of spatial variability in racial politics, and because states and municipalities and counties have so much discretion in what they do. So I just have a follow-up question to that, then. Have you, is it possible to use states as a unit of analysis here briefly for the Native American population, or are you interested to explore variation within the Northwest, or yes. within the West and the North and the West? I also have spent, you know, spent half of your presentation order once I'm from Minnesota. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it would be, also it's a really interesting contrast between Arizona and New Mexico, for example, uh, Arizona was um, in the maroon, yellow, and gray one, you know, it, can you pick up on any of those kinds of, yeah, does this, does this track on anything in your model that we use this state level variation here? Yeah, so what I'd love to do is tribe level Right? Uh, mm -hmm. And what I'd love to do is, is yes, sub-regional analysis, um, and we're working on that. The data doesn't exist at that level. Um, so the, the federal child welfare data um, is de-identified for counties with fewer than 1,000 cases. So virtually all of Indian country is de-identified um, in the data. So doing sub region and then tribal boundaries cross state lines very often. So states are a convenient unit of analysis, but not a, necessarily a good one. Um, 
Uh, my colleague Teresa Rocha Beardall and I are working to do tribe level analysis. Um, we're conducting focus groups and doing detailed law reviews, and we're hoping to get access to some restricted data um, that we might be able to do more granular geographic work with it. But you're right. Do you have any particular? So about Arizona and New Mexico in particular, I think one thing that's interesting is the relative power of the tribes, uh, in, uh, particularly uh, some of the Pueblo tribes have relatively high political power. And so we could think about the tribes themselves as sovereign actors in this relationship. And we think we could think about the tribes, um, it's kind of the, one of the ideas that kind of guides our thinking on this, is that sovereigns can kind of use, use their power as a shield to protect kids from going into the system. So in places where tribes have both uh, relatively unrestricted legal authority and resources to make policy, and it takes you know, resources to go show up to court and petition in an ICWA case, um, we would expect those places to see lower levels of contact, treating the tribes as um, sovereign actors in their own right. And I, 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 that will come sideways getting your question, I think. But I, I think that's a big part of what's going on in a place like Arizona or New Mexico. And a big part of also what's going on in Minnesota and South Dakota and North Dakota. Any other further questions? So thank you, Frank, for a very interesting presentation.